Zaytech. When are you going to teach me how to use those electrical test instruments so I can get some of those nice clean gravy jobs? <laughs> Anytime you're ready, I am, Bill. But let's get one thing straight. There's a lot more to electrical diagnosis than hooking up a voltmeter or ammeter. For a starter, you should get a good working knowledge of electrical fundamentals under your belt. Don't you agree, Jim? Tech's right, Bill. You don't have to be an electronics engineer, but a good understanding of how electricity and magnetism behave is mighty important. And that means starting with volts, amps, and ohms. Can you explain electricity to me without getting into atoms and neutrons and all that stuff you can't see? <laughs> I sure thing, Bill. Probably the easiest way to explain the behavior of electricity is to compare it with the behavior of water in a plumbing system. That's the way I got basic electricity through my head. For instance, a storage battery and a water tower both provide pressure. The battery is a source of electrical pressure, and the tank supplies water pressure. In other words, voltage is simply electrical pressure. It's voltage that pushes electricity through the wires in a circuit, just as water pressure pushes water through the pipes in a plumbing system. The flow of electricity and water can also be compared. An electric current is the movement or flow of electricity through a circuit, just as water flow is the movement of water through a pipe. Amperage is the electrical unit that tells you how much current is flowing through a wire or circuit. Just as gallons per minute is the measure of water flow, amperage is the measure of current flow. Any questions so far? Nope. As a matter of fact, I think I'm beginning to understand electricity. What comes next? Ohms and resistance, Bill. Electrical resistance is just that. Resistance to the flow of an electric current. For example, a small wire offers high resistance to the flow of electricity, just as a small pipe offers resistance to the flow of water. Incidentally, the length of the wire and the material it's made of also affect resistance. Electrical resistance is measured in ohms. One of the most important things you'll have to learn about electricity is the relationship between volts, amperes, and ohms. And that's where Ohm's law comes in. Ohm's law is an equation that says voltage equals amperage times resistance in ohms. It simply means that one volt will push one ampere through one ohm of resistance. Jim will explain how Ohm's law applies to electrical circuits. The easiest way to explain the various kinds of basic circuits you will find in an automobile is to use a 12-volt battery, some wire, and several 12-volt lamps. Let's consider the various ways we can connect one or more of these lamps to the battery. In the simplest kind of circuit, current flows from the battery through one lamp and back to the battery to complete the circuit. Most automotive circuits have more than one lamp or resistance unit and aren't quite this simple. For instance, if we connect two or more lamps or resistance units so that there is only one continuous path for current flow, we have a series circuit. In a series circuit, all of the current must flow through each resistance unit. In a series circuit, the current in amperes is always the same everywhere in the circuit. This is always true, regardless of how many resistance units you connect in series. What happens to the voltage in a circuit is something else again. The voltage is different at various points in a circuit because a voltage drop always occurs when current is pushed through a resistance. Voltage drop is the difference between the voltage available at one point in a circuit and the voltage at another point in the same circuit. Jim will tell you about the total resistance in a series circuit. To get the total resistance in a series circuit, you simply add up all the resistances. For instance, if you have a 1 ohm and a 2 ohm lamp connected in series, their total resistance is 3 ohms. In a parallel circuit, the current flow and resistance story is a bit different. In a parallel circuit, the lamps, or resistance units, 
are connected so that there is more than one path for the current to follow. Part of the current flows through one lamp and part through the other lamp. If the resistance of two lamps isn't the same, the flow won't be the same through the two branches of the parallel circuit. You can use Ohm's law to figure out that in this 12-volt system, 12 amperes will flow through the 1-ohm resistance, but only 6 amperes will flow through the 2-ohm resistance. Next, let's consider the total current flow in the circuit. The total current flow in a parallel circuit is always equal to the sum of the current flow in each of the branches. In our example, the total current flow is 6 plus 12, or 18 amperes. In other words, more current can flow through two paths than can flow through one path. How about the voltage drop across the resistance in the parallel circuit? Is it the same as it would be across the same resistance in a series circuit? It sure is, Bill. However, there's a bit more to voltage drop and total resistance in a parallel circuit than we have time to cover here. So be sure and read what the reference book has to say about Ohm's law and parallel circuits. Right now, I think Jim's ready to talk about magnetism. The simplest type of magnet is a bar magnet. Lines of magnetic force leave the bar at the North Pole and enter again at the South Pole. These invisible lines of magnetic force make up the magnetic field. I've seen that demonstrated with a magnet and iron filings, so I get the idea. Good. Now, let's look at another type of magnetic field. Current flow through a wire creates magnetic lines of force around the wire. These circular lines of force have no polarity, no north or south pole. However, if we form a wire into a loop and send a current through the wire, each circular line of force leaves at one side of the loop and enters at the other side of the loop. In other words, the lines of force all pass through the center of the loop. Let's see what this does. Forming a current-carrying conductor into a loop creates a weak electromagnet having north and south poles. The magnetic lines all leave the inside of the loop at the north pole, flow around the outside of the loop, and re-enter at the South Pole, just like a bar magnet. A practical electromagnet has many loops of wire around an iron core. The more turns of wire, the more lines of magnetic force, and the stronger the electromagnet. The iron core concentrates the lines of force to make a much stronger magnetic field. Are you still with us, Bill? Sure enough, Tech. I thought for a minute you might lose me among those lines of magnetic force, but I managed to follow Jim's explanation. What next? Suppose we have Jim explain how electricity and magnetism team up to generate a voltage, make an electrical motor run, and turn low voltage into high voltage for the ignition system. I'm all ears, Tech. When a magnetic field moves so that it cuts across a conductor, a voltage is generated in the conductor. If the conductor is connected to a lamp, current will flow through the lamp and the lamp will light. When a voltage is generated by magnetic lines of force cutting across a conductor, the process is called electromagnetic induction. It doesn't make any difference whether the field and lines of force move across the conductor or the conductor moves across the field. In an alternator, a magnet is rotated inside of a stationary conductor so that lines of force cut across the conductor. This induces a voltage and an alternating current in the conductor or stator. Of course, this alternating current has to be changed to direct current before we can use it for charging the battery. I won't try to explain how the six rectifiers used in our alternators change alternating current to direct current. That would take half a film and the entire reverse side of this record. And since it's time to reverse the record so we can hear the other side, will one of you fellas out there please rectify that situation? 
I can understand how an alternator can generate a voltage because there's mechanical movement involved, the rotors being driven by the engine. But I don't see how an ignition coil without any moving parts can generate voltage. A coil doesn't generate voltage. It just turns low voltage into high voltage. There are a couple of facts about induced voltages you have to understand before Jim explains an ignition coil. For instance, increasing the speed at which the magnetic lines of force cut across a conductor increases the voltage induced in the conductor. Increasing the strength of the magnetic field and the number of lines of force increases the voltage induced. And last but not least, the greater the number of turns of wire cut by the moving magnetic field, the greater the voltage induced in these turns of wire. Why don't you take it from there, Jim? Okay, Tech. An ignition coil has a primary winding of heavy wire and a secondary winding with many more turns of fine wire. These are both wound around the same soft iron core. Current flow through the primary windings produces a strong magnetic field around both the primary and the secondary windings. If current flow through the primary windings is suddenly stopped, the magnetic field will collapse into the iron core. Lines of force will cut across both the primary and the secondary windings. A voltage is induced in both windings by the movement of the collapsing lines of force. Since there are thousands of turns of fine wire in the secondary winding, the induced voltage is very high, high enough to jump a spark plug gap. Since there are far fewer turns in the primary winding, the voltage induced is relatively low. Although the voltage induced in the primary windings is much lower than in the secondary, it may reach several hundred volts. This voltage is great enough to arc across ignition contacts and burn them. That's one reason why an ignition condenser is needed. The condenser absorbs the current flow from the primary windings until the ignition contacts are opened far enough to prevent arcing. In other words, by the time the condenser is fully charged, the space between the contacts is wide enough to prevent the voltage in the primary windings from pushing a spark across the contact gap. The condenser does something even more important. It stops current flow in the primary windings very abruptly. This, in turn, speeds up the collapse of the magnetic field, increasing the speed at which the lines of force cut the secondary windings. Increasing the speed of the collapsing magnetic lines increases the voltage induced in the secondary. So you can see that the condenser is very important to good ignition voltage and contact life. Now, let's get into another important electrical unit. The electric starting motor did more than anything else to put the little woman in the driver's seat. No doubt about it, electric starters contributed greatly to the popularity of motor cars. Let's take time to explain how an electric motor works. Just what I had in mind. Let's start with two magnets. If you bring the north pole of one close to the south pole of the other, what happens? Magnetic attraction pulls them together. Exactly, Bill. Now, suppose we put a bar magnet in the field of a horseshoe magnet so that the poles aren't lined up. The bar magnet will turn until the poles do line up. Of course, a motor that'll rotate only part of a revolution isn't very practical. Here's how we take care of that. We use an electromagnet in place of the bar magnet. The windings of the electromagnet are connected to a battery through brushes. This gives us a simple armature that'll keep on turning. Here's why. When the poles of the armature and the horseshoe magnet start to line up, the brushes momentarily disconnect the armature windings from the battery. The armature coasts past the point where the poles line up. As soon as the armature poles coast past the horseshoe magnet poles, the brushes reconnect the armature windings to the battery. However, the polarity of the armature is now reversed. 
the poles of the horseshoe magnet are now repelling instead of attracting the armature. So it keeps on turning. I get it. The magnetic poles repel each other for a quarter revolution and attract for the next quarter of a revolution. Then the polarity is reversed and they again repel for the next quarter and attract each other for the last quarter revolution. <laughs> you know, Jim, I think our friend Bill is ready for your explanation of what's inside a voltmeter and ammeter so he'll understand what he's doing when he hooks them up. Just what I had in mind, Tech. The basic working parts of a voltmeter and an ammeter are the same. Each has a permanent horseshoe-type magnet and a pointer attached to a movable coil or armature. The way this coil is connected to the test leads makes the difference between a voltmeter and an ammeter. In a voltmeter, the windings of the movable coil are connected to the test leads through a high resistance. This resistance limits the amount of current flow through the meter. When a voltmeter is connected across a battery or circuit, current flow through the movable coil produces a magnetic field with north and south poles. The north pole of the coil is nearest to the north pole of the horseshoe magnet. Since like poles repel, the coil and pointer move any time current flows through the windings of the coil. The higher the voltage, the greater the current flow through the coil. The stronger the magnetic field around the coil, and the greater the movement of the coil and pointer. A voltmeter is always connected across a circuit without disconnecting any wires. The high resistance built into the voltmeter keeps current flow through the meter low. This protects it from overheating or damage. A voltmeter measures the voltage difference between the two terminals the meter leads are connected to. In other words, it measures the voltage drop between two points in a circuit. When one voltmeter lead is connected to a terminal in a circuit and the other is connected to a good ground, the voltmeter registers the voltage available at the terminal. That's because it's actually measuring the voltage drop between the terminal and the battery ground post. If I get the picture right, a voltmeter is always connected in parallel with the circuit, right? You get the picture, Bill. Matter of fact, I'd say you're just about ready to learn about ammeters. The movable coil windings of an ammeter are connected to the test leads through a low resistance shunt. So, an ammeter has very low resistance, whereas a voltmeter has very high resistance. A shunt circuit is nothing more than a parallel circuit. In an ammeter, most of the current flows through the low resistance of the shunt, and only a small amount flows through the coil. Never connect an ammeter across a circuit, the way you connect a voltmeter. Connecting an ammeter in parallel across a circuit would fry it. It sure would. Full battery voltage would push too much current through the low resistance of the shunt and the movable coil windings and burn them up. How do you connect an ammeter? You always connect an ammeter directly into the circuit, in series, so that all of the current flowing in the circuit flows through the ammeter. Hey, wait a minute. Won't putting all the current in the circuit through the ammeter burn up the coils? No, Bill, because you never connect an ammeter into a circuit unless there is enough resistance in the circuit you're testing to limit current flow through the meter. Let me give you a for instance. Suppose you connect an ammeter into a 12-volt circuit having a lamp in it with a 12-ohm resistance. Ohm's law will tell you that this lamp will let only one amp flow through the circuit. This can't damage a meter rated at one amp or more. Remember these two rules. Be sure and use an ammeter with enough capacity to handle the current flow in the circuit you're testing. And always connect an ammeter in series. Now, I'll tell you what you ought to do, Bill. Between now and our next tech meeting, Study this reference book. You'll find more detailed information on Ohm's Law, circuits and symbols, alternators, 
motors and ignition than we had time to cover today. If you have any questions, pester Jim for the answers. Just make sure you get a good working knowledge of electrical fundamentals under your belt in the next couple of weeks. I'll tell you why that's important. Next month, we're going to bring you a session on the practical application of electrical fundamentals to automotive troubleshooting. See you all next month. <laughs>